Make the present moment your friend, not your enemy. Make the present moment your friend. Then your whole life begins to change. Because what we call future is just an extension of your state of consciousness in the present moment. Hey guys, thank you so much for being here. A quick message before we dive in. You may be watching the show, but haven't taken a moment to click the subscribe button below. So if you've ever gained value from this show, it would mean so much to me if you click the subscribe button right now. And not only will this allow you to see these messages first, all this great content we have, you're gonna get notified first when it comes out. But the bigger our subscriber base grows, the more people we can impact and the bigger the guests we can get on this show as well. So again, thank you so much as always for your support. It means the world to me. Make sure to click the subscribe button below and let's dive into this conversation. I've got a number of topics today, one being about the law of attraction. I wanna talk about stress and anxiety. I wanna talk about why people suffer and how to get out of suffering. I wanna talk about relationships and how to know when you're in a healthy dynamic in relationships. All these things I wanna talk about today, but the first one, I felt like I was trapped in suffering for so many years. And I didn't know how to get out of this suffering, anxious, stressful feeling that would come and go, that would ruminate at night, that would keep me up at night, that would make me anxious in social settings, that would make me feel like I wasn't good enough. And I know people feel a sense of suffering, anxiety, overwhelm, and stress today, which seems like more than ever. I'm curious, with all of your wisdom and experience, how can we overcome or eliminate stress and suffering and anxiety in our lives when it seems to be crippling us? Usually, if you are um, not conscious of how your mind operates, and many people still are not conscious of how their mind operates, they uh, locate the, all the source of their troubles outside themselves. So they perceive uh, the um, whatever their life situation is, and every life situation is to some extent problematic. There's no life situation that is totally perfect, where everything is going well. Uh, no matter how much you practice positive thinking, which is, of course, a wonderful thing to do, nevertheless, there will always be things that are problematic in every life situation. Uh, so la la life always challenges you, no matter, no matter what stage you're at in your life, you get new challenges. Even if you are highly conscious or, in, let's say, enlightened, even the enlightened person still gets challenged by life situations, and that's a good thing. We may come back to that a little bit later. Um, the beginning of an awakening for people out of their this um, their suffering is the, the realization that uh, most of the psychological suffering, because this is what we're talking about, we're not talking yes. about tooth ache or yes. anything like that. No. We're talking about psychological suffering. Uh, the psychological suffering arises from stories that you tell yourself in your mind about situations, about your life or your life situation. As a practical exercise for, to introduce this teaching to people, I sometimes recommend this. Next time you find yourself in a situation that um, in which suffering arises, and suffering, of course, is a generic term. It can come in many forms. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, suffering is just feeling irritated or upset about something. It might be a minor thing, but you feel irritated. On the other end of the spectrum, there's deep despair, deep de depression and sadness, uh, or extreme forms of anxiety, panic, and all that. So we have the two, and in between, there's a wide range of different forms of suffering that arise, and very often, they are not recognized as suffering by people. If you're are, if you are mm. not conscious of how your mind operates, you don't even know that you are suffering. <laughs> you don't even know that there is another way, that there would be another way in which you could experience this particular situation. So I recommend next time you find, you, you become upset about something, 
or irritated, which is a form of suffer, minor form of suffering, experiment. I say, let's t let's take an imaginary situation that these things happen quite often to people. You're in the lineup. Let's say it's at the airport. Airport is a source where often people experience uh, psychological suffering because things don't 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 go the way they expect them to go. <laughs> yes, especially these days. Right. Uh, so you're in a lineup. They, uh, it's not moving. You're you're getting more and more irritated and upset. Or it could be anywhere. You're waiting, but it's not happening. You're waiting there or in a traffic time where on the telephone nobody's answering just to get automated message that says your call is important to us and the approximate waiting time is 45 minutes or whatever. <laughs> right. say, and you feel more and more you get angry and irritated. Now, I recommend the following practice because you're standing there or waiting there. You might as well practice. Ask yourself, how would I experience this situation if I did not add any interpretation or any thought to it? How would I experience this moment if I didn't add any thought to it, if I did not interpret it in any way, if I just allowed this to be as it is without uh, um, burdening it with this baggage of thought? It's so, okay, let's say you're standing in this lineup and it's you're very irritated. So how would I experience this if I did not, in other words, if I did not, in my mind, say this is bad mm. or, and, and all the other thoughts that come after that then because when you say this is bad then the next thought comes my life is bad and then you get a whole string of associated thoughts that are negative how would i experience this moment without adding any thought to it okay so there you stand and this would bring your attention into the present moment and so your attention moves into the present moment and in this present moment you're standing there and you, you're breathing, you're looking around, people moving, the, the whatever the room is you find yourself in, you're breathing, you're perceiving things, people, and suddenly you may find that this moment is actually free of suffering. The suffering did not arise, was not caused by the external circumstance, it was caused by the narrative in your mind about this circumstance. That's a huge distinction, and this is you begin to live consciously when you realize this. Until you realize that, you live unconsciously, which means, in spiritual terms, to live unconsciously is to be totally identified with whatever your mind is saying, the, 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 I call it the voice in the head, the narrative in your mind that tells you about how good thing, how bad things are, how, how they should be, they, they are, but they shouldn't be, they should be different. But they are, as they are always in this moment. Mm -hmm. You can't change this moment. Uh, so you become aware. This was discovered, by the way, uh, 2,000 years ago by... A not very well known ancient Greek philosopher Epictetus, and he said, uh, the, the, the most of your suffering is derived from what your mind is telling you about the situation, but not from the situation itself. Uh, yeah. And that's an enormous realization. And that can be the beginning of an awakening to see that the narrative in your mind is mostly what causes the suffering. Of, it is possible, of course, that an external situation may cause physical discomfort, obviously. Yes. That's possible. Your, your legs are hurting, your back is hurting, or it's too cold or too hot. Would, physical discomfort, of course, that's possible. But that is not suffering in the sense in which we use this term right here. In, mm -hmm. right now, the psychological suffering, unhappiness is another word you could use. It's a generic term for any form of negativity inside yourself, unhappiness, suffering. So you begin to realize that most of that arises from a mental narrative about a situation or about your circumstances, but not from the circumstances themselves. Uh. And, when, and then you can begin to practice. Every time you feel upset is arising, 
some form of negative anger is arising, some form of negativity, uh, blaming people in situations and saying this shouldn't be happening or something mm-hmm. is not happening but it should be happening or they should do this or they shouldn't do it. All right. kinds of narratives in your mind. So you spiritual awakening is you're beginning to be aware of what your mind is saying. Uh, the, the stories that you're telling yourself about situations, but also the stories you're telling yourself about what you call your life. <laughs> so, because people, there are millions of people in this world who live with a very painful sense of identity. Uh, they, they, they perceive their life as a burden. So yes. they live with this heaviness and they don't realize what they, this heaviness that they call my life is actually a narrative that they tell themselves. And they say, that's me. All the things that have happened to me, the dreadful things in the past that pe- people did to me or circumstances did to me, or maybe even the bad things that I did. So you get a very heavy identity built up and that becomes your sense of self and mm. people don't realize it's a it's a story you're continuously telling yourself in your mind, but you are so identified with the story that you don't exist. You're outside of the story, <laughs> and so that's um, that is what uh, the, what in 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 some spiritual traditions is called the self. The Buddha called it the self, which is the the mind made sense of self, which the Buddha said which ultimately he recognized that that mind-made sense of self is ultimately a kind of fiction that you that you live through. <laughs> uh, so now, when you realize that this is the case, this means at the, that at this point of realization, Another dimension of consciousness has arisen in you, which is not your mind. We could call it awareness, or we could call it presence. So when you realize what your mind is doing, that is not part of the conceptual mind that that works through uh, stories and words and concepts. It is a deeper, or you could say deeper or higher, dimension Mm. of consciousness that suddenly has arisen I often call it presence, uh, but another good word for it is awareness. So awareness is the ability to know what your mind is doing. Uh. And then the wonderful thing is, uh, at first it's just glimpses when you detach from the mind and say, oh, wow. And then you have moments when you're not suffering because you allow this moment to be as it is. Who, uh, but who are we when we detach from our own mind? Ah, very good question. Yes. So, at first you were identified with the the conceptual mind, the story making mind, and you you your sense of identity was the story of me, my past, uh, my memories, my beliefs, my that's right. All all these thoughts that are that are accumulated in my the bank of my mind from the past that I've told myself this happened to me, this is what's wrong with me, this is why I'm not good enough, or this person did this, or whatever. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, now, when the awareness arises, your sense of who you are, your sense of identity begins to shift from being lodged in the conceptual mind, the voice in the head, it goes to a deeper place and you realize who you are in your essence is actually the awareness itself. And that is a an amazing realization. Uh, the, in other words, this is a dimension of consciousness that is, I call it, beyond thought. Thinking is a is a wonderful thing. Thinking is a very powerful tool for creating. However, if thinking is all we have and we look, look for our identity in, in the mind, then that is very limiting. 
if mm. if thinking is used as a tool, it's very powerful and empowering and can be very creative. But if thinking becomes self-serving, in other words, you're completely identified with this stream of thinking that never, for most people, never stops all through the day. This, they're talking to themselves. There's a voice in the head. Sometimes they talk, they say, I, sometimes they talk to themselves and you, you shouldn't have done that. You're not you good idiot. enough. Yeah, all these things. <laughs> uh, so the, this, this is the most, well, the most important thing in a person's life. Uh, and this is why we're here is to experience this shift in consciousness so that increasingly in glimpses at first, but then increasingly your sense of who you are is the space of awareness, the presence. Is that, that, does that mean there's two of us? One could say that there is, on the one hand, I sometimes call it, on the one hand, you have your form identity. Your form is the most of physical body, which is the first thing people identify with. But really, it's not the physical body, it's the mental image of my body, uh, mm -hmm. which we are maybe happy about or either it can the body can be a source of pride or it can be a source of shame or anything in between <laughs> and so people identify with my body that's the first identity form identification and the next is the psychological form of me all the things that mm -hmm. I, I identify with in my past the, the past makes up who i think i am or the past conditioning starting in childhood the way it, by which the culture in which you grow up, the family in which you grow up, all those things be, become part of your identity. So you have form, I call it form identity on the one hand, and everybody obviously has one. No matter how conscious you are, you continue to have a physical body until you don't, and you have a form identity, a psychological form. But the, uh, there, there is a deeper identity also that, and this is spiritual awakening, that is, I call it essence identity, your essence. Yeah. And your essence is, if we want to put a, we use the term awareness and we use the term presence. But another term we can use, what that really is, is consciousness. The essence of who you are is consciousness, the light of consciousness itself. And this is not, this is something to be experienced. You cannot understand conceptually what it is that I'm talking about unless you experience in this moment, perhaps, what's well, the only moment there is, unless you experience what that means that, that you are, a set, in essence, you are consciousness, the the, the space or the light of consciousness between two thoughts, for example. Sometimes uh, there's a thought that comes to an end, another thought hasn't arisen yet, you have a gap of five seconds or ten seconds, and uh, this, is, this is an, it's an experiential thing. To realize yourself as consciousness is, it implies that for at first, first for very very brief instances, the mind becomes still, it subsides. But you are still there. So when you are not, let's say, uh, let's assume that you you let go of any memory of your past, uh, you, because you don't need it right now. That you don't remember your past at all, uh, or your name, or anything. Uh, and you're not thinking about future. In fact, you're not thinking at all, but you are aware. You're aware of your sense perceptions, but you're not interpreting sense perceptions. You're allowing sense perceptions to be. Now, who or what are you when you're not telling yourself who or what you are? Who or what are you without the story? <laughs> and some, some people are afraid of that. They, they're so attached to the story, they can't let go. But it's a wonderful practice for some people. They only let go when the story that they have, their, that they call their life, becomes so painful 
that they can't stand it anymore. And right. then sometimes they experience a breakthrough. <laughs> but, but why do so many people hold on to their their pain identity, their past story, for decades sometimes? Why do they hold on to it so long when you might see their friends and family seeing that they're suffering and struggling, but they're unwilling to break free of this old identity or current identity they've been holding on to for so long? Sometimes, like you said, people will finally get so bad, they finally let that identity go. But why does it take an extreme, horrible breakdown or pain for people to finally say, you know, this old story of mine, this old identity doesn't work for me anymore. I want to let it go and step into a new identity. Why is that so challenging for people? Well, it's we all inherit, it goes back thousands of years in a collective consciousness or unconscious humanity. We all inherit this kind of dysfunction, a mental, of course, another word for that is the ego. It is yes. the human ego. Ego, sometimes when people use the term ego, they interpret it in different ways. Then there's the, the ego that's used by Freud, the Freudian ego and other egos. But when I use the term ego, or when it's used in a spiritual context, ego simply means complete identification with your mind, with the uh, thinking, the, the mental, emotional uh, makeup of you. That's ego is complete identification with that. And so that's so deeply ingrained. Every human being inherits that kind of dysfunction. Wow. In, and so it's so hard to let go because it's so deeply ingrained in, in the every by the con conditioning of your mind. And uh, so some people need an enormous amount of suffering. And even, even with that, some people don't awaken. Even then, they, they be unhappy until they die. Or they die e even at an early age because the, the, the body can't stand the unhappiness anymore. It isn't functioning properly anymore because the, the, the mental state interferes with the otherwise harmonious functioning of the body. So they make themselves right. ill through stress. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a... So we are faced with, it's, it's an enormous, it's, a, it's also very, it's a challenging and wonderful thing to realize that your, your purpose here, beyond any purpose that you might have on a personal level, which also has a function, uh, but your deeper purpose is to, 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 evolve, to evolve as a conscious being and to go beyond the ego here. So that consciousness evolves you, because you're only, you're an expression of the universal consciousness. And universal consciousness throughout the universe is awakening. We live in an awakening universe. So gradually, life forms, in our case, the human life form, becomes, begins to awaken into a, a higher level of consciousness. Yes. Uh, so the well, this so the 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 essence here is realizing this the possibility of uh, uh, living in this a different state of consciousness where you're not necessarily always immediately thinking and interpreting things. And and if there's someone if there's someone watching or listening that is thinking to themselves, you know what? <clears throat> I'm just feeling pain psychologically kind of off and on consistently and I haven't been able to figure out how to break free and, and feel a sense of true harmony internally, true peace. Yes, of course, there's challenges that are going to come our way as human beings, you know, as we continue to grow. But as a baseline, peace and harmony, and they just can't figure out how to get there. What type of application or what do people need to be aware of and then take action on in order to start working towards inner peace and harmony? Right. Yes. Good question. Um, well, a good entry point uh, is uh, the present moment. That's the, the present moment is the, I sort of, sometimes call it the portal into that state of consciousness that we call presence or awareness. Uh, now, the um, 
the uh, the egoic mind, as I call it, the egoic mind uh, is not really interested in the present moment, and it usually tries to obscure the present moment. It's interested right. in some other imagined moment, but the not past, this, the future, past worry, and future. doubt. Yeah. Yes, it ignores the present moment, but the the per, first realization is. Uh, the 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 absolute importance of the present moment in your life it's the foundation for everything and your relationship to the present moment determines how the future evolves but what we call future which by the way never arrives as because mm. when it arrives it's again the present moment yes <laughs> so the the realization that all you ever have all that you can ever experience is intrinsically linked with the present moment. It's inseparable from the present moment. Your entire life unfolds in and as the present moment. That all there ever is. The the past, when the past happened, it was the present moment. It couldn't happen anywhere else. And when you remember the past, you remember it in the present moment. <laughs> mm, right. The future, when the future comes, when tomorrow comes, it won't be tomorrow anymore. It will be the now. There was a, a a British pub in London that had. I lived in London for many years. They had a sign on the bar that says "Free beer tomorrow," <laughs> and of course, tomorrow never comes. <laughs> so the sign is always true. <laughs> that's so funny. If you go the next day, say no tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, wow, that's funny. So tomorrow actually never comes. Of course, we need to make plans on a practical level. The future is indispensable. We need we need it future for us to get together here to talk, to stipulate day and time for connecting. So on a practical level, we cannot do without future. But on a deeper level, on a deeper psychological level, it's important to realize that the future as such does not actually exist because all you can ever experience or have is the present moment. Yes. So that's the starting point. It begins with the realization of the absolute primary importance of the present moment. This is all you ever have. So you might as well have a good relationship with the present moment because if your relationship with the present moment is dysfunctional, your entire life is dysfunctional. <laughs> right. So how do we so how do we if someone watching or listening is saying, Well, my present is really challenging right now. Yes. I'm I'm I've got a lot of debt. I've you know, I feel I've got some sickness in my body and my health is not there. My you know, I'm going through a divorce or breakup. The career is not as good as I want it to be. There's some type of pain in the present. Yeah. Now, how can I actually enjoy the present when I'm in breakdown everywhere? Yeah. Let's let's leave aside for a moment physical pain. That's a it's an, another story. But uh, the, the 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 psychological pain that's there is again associated with certain situations. It's associated with your life situation, which may be problematic, problematic, problematic on some level, whether it's financial or relationship or work situation or living situation. It's very or or health situation. It's very likely that at, at any given time, your life situation will be problematic, problematically on at least one of these levels. Right. And sometimes it's a lot of money. It's two or three or four becomes really problematic. You, you, you lose your all your money, your, your cost, uh, you lose your job, your wife leaves you, you or you lose your home. All, these things can do sometimes happen. Yes. So you have that. Uh, and again, that's then it's that's usually the these life challenges, situational challenges are usually perceived as being part of the present moment, but they're not really the present moment. They are what is called, what I call your life situation. But other than your life situation, you have something that I call your life. 
Life situation exists in time. Life is now. And never not now. And since your life is now, you have to ask yourself, yes, I have all these problems. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent, maybe. Or my relationship is problem. I have to, I'm in the middle of divorce proceedings. All these things that happen to people. Uh, or I've just be, been let go. Of my, my, or my company has collapsed or whatever. Or it might collapse. Maybe it's doing well, but it may not do well next year. All kinds of things that are perceived as problematic, which sometimes are real and sometimes are just imagination. That again, we need to differentiate between when people say, say they're having big problems, sometimes they are just in the mind because they, they think of things that might go wrong. At other times, there are actually real challenges happening around you. Right. But here again, it's all to single out the present moment and not to ignore action that you might take or have to take in order to uh, change certain situations. Is, is there any action that I can take? That's, uh, that's a secondary question. It's important, but it's secondary. Primary question, I often ask people, what problem do you have at this moment? And then they usually start by saying, well, uh, I'm running out of money or this I'm living in this unpleasant this place, well, anyway, I said, no, no, running out of money, it's not, this, what, this, just this moment, right here and now, what problem do you have here and now, in this moment? And then you look, you look around, you maybe you become aware of your, that you're breathing, and you look around, and then you, reluctantly sometimes, people have to admit, well, okay, I'm ready to admit that at just this moment, there isn't actually a problem. The next one there might be, but the next one is again this. It, of course, the, at this moment, you may have a challenge that you immediately need to deal with. If, a, if, if, you, um, if you're going for a walk and you encounter a wild animal coming towards you, you, you don't say, I don't have any problems at this moment. It, that's a challenge that you need to deal with, but we wouldn't call that a problem. I mean, if uh, I sometimes go for walks in the forest, and occasionally there are bears here. So if you encounter a bear, that is not a problem. It's a challenge, and you deal with it. Either you run away or you don't. Whatever you do, you deal right. with it. The problem is it lives in the mind. <laughs> the uh, it, So... The, the to get out of that is to give much more attention to the present moment and realize that in the present moment the problem cannot survive. <laughs> Say the, that one more time in, in the present moment. The problem, any problem you have cannot survive in the present moment. Because problem is a burden that you carry in your mind, your mental emotional field. That's what a problem is. The rest is situations and circumstances. Either you leave them alone if there's nothing you can do, or you take some action. But they're, uh, they're not a problem. Either you act or you don't act. And if you don't act, you take your attention into the present moment and see that it's actually okay. Right. And I've had, to, I've had I often get correspondence from people in prison. They're in prison and they, we have, through my foundation, we are sending thousands of thousands of books to, to prisons and so and for prisoners to read. I often get communication. People realize that in their prison cell, they realize that actually I have no problem. In other words, they come to a complete alignment with the present moment. There's no uh. longer an entity that says this should not be happening because that's where the suffering arises. Uh, and of course, prison is a situation where you can't probably can't take much action. Well, you can try to escape, but you probably won't succeed. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> You've got so, to accept and surrender. Uh, yes. So there's always the action uh, may need to be taken, but if no action is possible, then you come to a place of surrender. But it's positive surrender, not negative surrender. Uh, 
Positive surrender is an uncompromising yes to the present moment. An uncompromising yes to what is. They, that is a place of great inner power that arises with, yes, this is what is. That's the starting point. So you're not arguing with the isness of things because that's insane. You cannot argue with what is. And that the, the, this constant arguing with what is, this actually amplifies the ego, the egoic consciousness. The ego loves to argue with what is. It needs to. It loves enemies, it, and the ego makes the present moment into an enemy. All right. Now, can you see how insane that is to make the present moment into your enemy because that's all you ever have. That means you make your whole life into an enemy because your whole life is the present moment. <laughs> right, right. So I, I sometimes say become, make the present moment your friend, not your enemy. Make the present moment your friend then your whole life begins to change. Because what we call future is just an extension of your state of consciousness in the present moment. So if your state of consciousness is negative, it is very likely that you will experience much more negativity in the so-called future. <laughs> right. If the present moment, if you're, if you're in the pre present moment, you, you're in a place of acceptance, of positive acceptance, then... Uh, it's very likely that the the present, the so-called future. I so I always say so-called future because the future as such doesn't exist. It's always when it comes, it's a now. Yes. <laughs> so the so-called future reflects your state of consciousness in the present moment. So that's really a very important realization. So that is how the absolute importance of your state of consciousness here and now, what is your state of consciousness now? Rather than thinking that something else is more important than my state of consciousness. So in any situation, you're faced with any situation, what is the state of consciousness with which you face the situation? Is it, are you in a state of resistance or negativity towards the situation? Because when in, in any endeavor that you undertake, Inevitably, obstacles will arise in anything. Yes. You want to yes. create something new. Obstacles, but obstacles come in many forms. Sometimes in the form of human beings who, who don't like you to, to do what you're doing, or it can come in the form of other structure structures that are in society, the rigid structures. So, and you get all kinds of bureaucratic obstacles or whatever the obstacles are. So what, how do you, you face an obstacle? What is your state of consciousness when an obstacle arises? Do you immediately become angry? Do you become or despondent? Or do you start complaining in your mind about people and talking about others, how awful this situation is and complaining? Or are you able to just immediately say, this is what it is? So you face the obstacle, not in a state of resistance, come from a state of power, this is what is, and then when you are in that state of presence, very often a right action arises spontaneously. Then you do, you find yourself doing the right thing because you're not making the situation into an enemy. And this is very important. In any, if you want to achieve great things, uh, and a huge obstacle for people is to... Uh, start complaining and building up stress when things go wrong with this. In other words, things shouldn't be happening. So they become right. negative. They become unpleasant. They become unpleasant to people, colleagues and pe people they work with. And a lot of negative energy can build up in a company and so on. So, uh, and that is not some of the most effective people in this world, uh, there are perhaps a few, uh, they don't w work with negativity. They they work immediately with a, a positive attitude. They yes. they 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 don't make the present moment into into an enemy. They might never have heard any spiritual teaching, so perhaps that is some kind of innate wisdom that they have, or maybe they've learned this lesson in a past lifetime, who knows. 
<laughs> so, th yeah. but, so the so the important is always start with the present moment, and again, the, what is what 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 problem do I have now? In the, is there a problem here and now, just this moment? Well, actually, no, not not really. Not the problem isn't here. The problem is in the mind, but it's not here. That's a place of power. And then, the, then you bec you become aligned with the the, po like the power of now, uh. the power of the present moment. So a, which is the power of consciousness itself beyond the ego, far far, more powerful. And the ego is only a, like, it's like the reflected light that like the moon reflects the light of the sun, and the, the ego reflects the light of consciousness. So it's, oh, it's only it's not power. There's no power in ego itself. In the same way, there's no light in the moon. It's just reflected light. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful. This has been fascinating so far. I'm sure we could talk about you know consciousness and suffering for hours, but I want to uh, get to a few other concepts here. Um, one of them being about the law of attraction, because I, you mentioned kind of synchronicities and serendipities and kind of this idea of when we align ourselves to consciousness and to more harmony thoughts, to more peaceful thoughts, in my experience, things just come. You know, the right things that I'm intending, it's they happen very quickly and unexpectedly. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on your definition of the law of attraction, but also maybe the three habits that you see people doing the most that hurt them from attracting effortlessly using the law of attraction? Right. Well, the main uh, mistake perhaps that people make is uh, not coming from a place of fullness, but coming from a place of neediness and, uh, and putting too much attention on, on what is the undesirable conditions so that they want to get rid of, but but, but mentally co almost continuously focusing on the undesirable condition, like not enough money, for example, which is the problem for many uh, people. Uh, so, so let's use let's use money for the example. Then the law of attraction with money. How could we attract more wealth? or financial abundance in our life using the law of attraction? Yeah. Well, first of all is the acknowledgement of abundance that is already here and now. And not, and not focusing on the lack of abundance that is here and now, which you could find by thinking about it, but to actually focus on where is the abundance that I can find here and now, and that is all around you it is in nature when you look at the the abundance of nature the abundant the multiplicity of life forms the, the wonder of nature uh, the abundance of even even or let's say you're in a city uh, you can look at uh, appreciate all the things that you see uh, around you you don't need to necessarily own it or buy it just appreciate right. it and so this first the appreciation of the goodness of life that is always all around you, even if you have no money, there's still the goodness of life is all around you. You see it all around you. The sunshine, I mean, the sun is the ultimate symbol of abundance because it gives energy of itself almost eternally. I mean, eventually the sun will die, but as far as we are concerned, it's virtually eternal. It it pours out energy continuously, and this uh, at some point we will realize that even on the level of energy, the universe is infinitely abundant. So we we will no longer need things that we're using now, fossil fuels, and those things. We have access to other forms of energy that are more helpful. <laughs> But right. the abundance, the abundance is all around you. Let's say you walk your past in the city. You're walking past a flower shop, and you look at wow, such beauty, appreciation. Even to seeing a beautiful man or woman or nice, or 
uh, or even a beautiful car, all that. I love that. Not why don't I have that car? Why does he have that car? It's all egoic, much narratives that make you unhappy to appreciate. No, nature, of course, is very powerful. And then you to appreciate the aliveness in your body, that you're breathing and you can actually feel that the, the your body, many people can't feel that. I call it the inner body awareness. The... You feel that you're, that every cell of your body is pervaded with a sense of aliveness, with energy, and you can feel that. That is abundance. So there's abundance of life all around you. There's a, there's, you can feel the life within you also. And so we could, some people call it gratitude. I call it more gra appreciation. The appreciation of the abundance of life that is always around you. That's a wonderful starting point. Okay. Uh, so you're not focusing on lack, you're focusing on abundance. And even even when you don't have any, if you feel like yes, you don't you have don't, anything, you can it, find abundance around you. Yes, always and acknowledge it. The good yes. things of life, acknowledge, but even the seemingly insignificant things, like uh, when I look out of the window, I sometimes there's trees out here. I, right now, I can look out this. I can see there's a slight breeze and the branches are swaying slightly in the wind. It's beautiful. And there's the tree in all its majesty and stillness. It's been there for a hundred years. And that's wonderful. I don't need to own that tree. I mean, owning in that sense is ultimately a bit meaningless anyway. Yes, I own this house where I'm right now, but at some point I'll I'll be gone. And so what does it mean? The, the house with it, somebody else will own the house. <laughs> Own is right. a secondary. I'm not saying to let go of ownership sometimes gives, can give stability to your life on a practical level, but there's something more important. So uh, this appreciation, or if you want to call it gratitude, some people recommend, um, I think Oprah said that she has had for many, many years a, a notebook or journal where she puts, writes down every day things that she's grateful for. And um, these are and, uh, these are usually seemingly insignificant things, but, but it's important not to overlook that. And I don't think she's writing down, uh, "I'm grateful that I have a private jet," or "I'm grateful that I have a two point five billion dollars in the bank." <laughs> That's <laughs> right. She she writes down the, the small things that I'm every grateful day for I, my garden. I'm grateful that I get to plant a flower today. Yeah. I'm grateful that I get to go on a walk with my friends. I'm grateful that I woke up yes, today. Yes, yes. The next thing is, uh, the second thing you could say is uh, giving. To give of to give energy to other people, uh, appreciation itself is already a form of certain outflow of energy. When you appreciate this tree beauty, there is an energy connection with the tree. There's a, the consciousness connects you with the tree, uh, and uh, kindness is part of giving. A kindness to another person, not to, because you want anything from that person, but but because it feels so good to have this a sense of we could call it goodwill that flows out of you towards another person, even if you just ho ho hold the door open for somebody, or it's a remark, or it's a, that's a love, what's the, lovely, I love your dress, or whatever you say, if it's genuine, uh, or uh, to say an encouraging word to somebody, um, or to whatever it may be, a smile, to, a smile at somebody, it's a, it's a, even that is a form of giving. This, this connection with another uh, kindness is a very powerful thing. So you are giving. You're not. Ex you're not. It, the more you give, that in it, it, it's in the law of attraction or nature. It's as you give, it must come back to you in another form. Um, but it doesn't work if you give out of an obligation that you feel you should be giving or. It needs to be a genuine sense of wanting to give and feeling how, how good it feels to give, not because 
mentally you 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 feel you always need to you always need to help people because otherwise uh, you you do, you don't don't think of yourself as a good person or something that's all mind stuff but to experience how how, how good it feels to be to give so we, we have on the one hand appreciation gratitude and appreciation are kind of silly that giving every day of uh, in whatever form uh, and the next thing is that's obviously Jesus already in in one sentence one could say uh, told us the the essence of uh, manifesting and how it works and he said uh, whenever you uh, pray for something that you want uh, believe that you already have it and it will be given to you yes there's the key now the important thing is he did not say believe that you will have it he said believe that you already have it now this may not be immediately clear to people how, how do i do that uh, how do i believe that i already have it when i know that i don't have it <laughs> right 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 how do you get that belief of having it before yeah. knowing, feeling, tasting, smelling the thing that you want? Yes. So you feel uh, the thing. It is already a mental reality in your mind. How do you feel now that you have it in your mind? How do you, how, do, how does it feel? And this feeling is really where the power of manifestation lies. But what is that feeling? Because that feeling of having it already, and feeling this deep sense of satisfaction, is really uh, connecting with a the deeper power within yourself, which is the power where all, all sense of aliveness originates there. It's the deeper sense of aliveness that comes from consciousness itself. So you, right. you, you, you now you might believe it might differ from person to person. One person might think, okay, what I want is a a big house with a or on the, overlooking the ocean or whatever, and then you you feel yourself you're you're already there, uh, experiencing that. Another person might think, well, what I want is uh, to have uh, this great. Uh, a company that does good things in this world, and it's and, and uh, I'm at the end. How does that feel? But you might find that the feeling is actually basically always the same. Whether your mind says, "But it's a house uh, overlooking the ocean," now why? Or the other person says, "Well, this is a, the company that I'm well ahead of that's doing great things in this world." The feeling is basically the same feeling. And, and the feeling is a feeling of fullness of life. Yes. Of completeness. <laughs> that is power. So when you feel this feeling of fullness and then you associate it with a mental image, that, that is the power of manifestation there. But the feeling itself is beyond the mental image and is beyond whatever form you are able to manifest in this world because that is the feeling of the inherent sense of aliveness that comes when you could go deeper into yourself and experience the the presence that you are in this to to know yourself as the presence is inherently joyful and powerful to know yourself as so and that is you manifest from a place of fullness not from a place of lack right. the fullness is already there and that also means if for some reason it doesn't manifest, because not everybody's desires manifest. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's still happening. LA, for example, uh, if you go to any any good restaurant in LA, it's more than likely that the waiter or waitress will be actors waiting for for their big breakthrough. Yes. <laughs> and then yep. It's just not possible for so many people to have the big breakthrough in LA as actors. <laughs> Some may do, few may do, but most probably won't. 
but they right. have made, they probably have other breakthroughs that perhaps are much more important than what their ego tells them is important. And to add to that, I love this, what you're sharing here, because I want people to really feel this and understand this and embrace it. Because when we try to manifest from lack, it's going to be this needy energy, which was your first point that kind of kills the, the dream of the law of attraction. And when we manifest from a place of fullness, like you spoke of, like feeling a feeling of fullness, wholeness, excitement, abundance, joy inside of us. And if it doesn't happen, if that dream doesn't come to us in the next year or five or 10 years, then we've lived a full, rich life every moment till that moment. Like we've, we've lived a full year of feeling excited and passionate and good about ourselves. And that energy is magnetic. You will draw in great people, partners, relationships, opportunities that maybe you couldn't have dreamed of because the energy you you gave into the world like you talked about. And I think that's the the big point for me is the dream and the idea that you have, maybe your ego wants, maybe it, you won't have it. But man, you'll live a great, beautiful, rich life in the process of pursuing it. Very good point. So in other words, the journey is what matters. The, well, the, arri the arriving at some destination is the end point, but it's secondary. The journey yes. is always the journey. It's always now. That's what matters. And so sometimes what you wanted to manifest uh, does not happen, but something else manifests that could be even better. In fact, in many even cases, better. it's much better than what it, you have that yeah. envisaged. Term. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was I always wanted to be a professional athlete, and I played professional football for about a year and a half before I got injured. In the injury, I broke my wrist, and I was wearing a cast, and I had a surgery, and I had a cast on for six months. And it took about a year and a half for me to use my, my wrists again from the injury. And during that time, I was in a state of extreme sadness and a loss and a grief of this identity that I once had and this dream that I once had that I was working so hard for my whole life to manifest, to create. And then all of a sudden this injury broke the, the, my abilities to do that. And I remember thinking, what am I gonna do with my life? Like, what's the point? 23, 24 years old, I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? And it led me into this journey that I'm on now of uh, doing this interview series and podcast for the last 10 years that I'd much rather have this life than the life of a professional athlete now. Like, and sometimes, like you said, going back to the beginning of this, if we can accept and surrender in the positive way to see what good can come, it may be challenging in the moment, but it's been a blessing since then. Yes, that's a lovely story. That's, uh, that's how it actually works. And another uh, thing to mention is, let's say you do, uh, do let's say you do manifest what it is you wanted to manifest. Um, uh, when you come from this place of fullness, you do not have, yes, you have an appreciation of what you have achieved, but you don't have an excessive attachment to what you have achieved. Uh, so it, let's say you are, you are able to manifest that you have a, a, a house overlooking the ocean and you manifest it, and there you have it. And one day uh, you get, you, when you get home, you find your house has fallen into the ocean. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, so the, the whole thing that you worked so hard for to achieve is suddenly gone. But this place of fullness that, that enabled you to, to, to manifest that is still there. It's beyond outer forms. Yeah. And you feel full in life. Maybe there's a moment of sadness during that, but if you're not attached to the physical things you've manifested, um, I'm sure if I lost my home, I feel like it's a sanctuary. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful, peaceful space, but I've lived in two bedroom apartments for most of my life. And I felt like those were peaceful places for me. And it's not like, I'm sure I'd be sad for a minute, but then I could also create the sense of fullness in the next space. Exactly. And I have this, like, see, um, I, um, for a long time, uh, until, until my 32nd year, 
I, my main form of transportation was, except other than public transport, was a bicycle. That's beautiful. Uh, so I got my driver's license when I was 30, <laughs> in my first car when I was 32, and that was a very What city old... were you in? What what country in, or city? London, London and Cambridge, I lived uh, mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, and the I loved my bicycle. I just wonder, I, I appreciated it. I loved it. Sometimes I was just looked at it, was standing there, and I had a laugh. And then somebody gave me, I was poor at the time, somebody gave me an older car, and I loved that. And and then I was able to, I got a little bit of money, I was able to buy the cheapest car I could find. It was called Lada, it's a Russian lake. Uh, it, uh, they still make them, but they're a bit better now than they used to be. And people would laugh at these cars because they were notorious for breaking down. But it was very, very cheap. And I bought this. And it never broke down. I loved that car. It never broke down. It, it, I must admit, very embarrassing on hills because you couldn't. <laughs> you were holding everybody up. You had up. to get out and push it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I loved that car. And, um, the, and then I... I eventually left England and I sold it. A friend of mine was interested. I sold it to him. And two or three weeks after he bought it, it broke down and and couldn't get repaired anymore. It was incredible. Uh, it's almost as if because I, I have this kind of relationship, even with so-called inanimate objects. They, I think that even there, there is a, there is a glimmer of, consciousness in everything really that's how i sense things there's a glimmer of consciousness so uh, and when you have an intention and an appreciation for the thing that you're with the bike the the cheap car it tends to take care of you when you take care of it with your energy right very much i had, very a, I had a similar experience when i moved to la uh i don't know 11 12 years ago I didn't have a car in my 20s. I had, a, I had like a $500 car that broke down after six months. And so I walked everywhere in Columbus, Ohio for about a year. And then I moved to New York City. I didn't need a car. And then I moved to LA and I bought a $4,000 car. It was like a 1997 uh, year old uh, car. And probably one of the oldest cars on the road. I drove it every day. It was a $4,000 car. And for, for being in LA, you know this world, that's... That's kind of like looked down upon. It's like, oh, you don't have this nice new car. I drove it for five or six years. I loved it. It was like, it got me from place to place. It was comfortable. It was reliable. And I was happy with it. So yeah, it took care of me and yeah. uh, I took care of it. Yes. And that's, uh, that's uh, I, I feel the same. And then later, then finally I had the money. I bought a, a, an expensive car, which I still have. I bought it 16 years ago. It's now a kind of classic. And and I I love that as much as I loved the bicycle many right. years ago. Uh, yeah, that's so cool. So it's this, the same, and and it's not. It's many people, of course, have an egoic identification with their car. But what we are talking about is very different. It's not that. It's not an egoic. If I had had an ego, egoic identification with my cheap Russian car my ego would have felt diminished because all yes. the people laughed at it. It's all oh, look with scar. <laughs> but I, did, I didn't mind. It was fine. I didn't have egoic identification. And I don't have an egoic identification with the, this more expensive classic car that I have now that's 16 years old. But I still, I love it. Uh, I have a kind of relationship with it. If something happened to it, uh, I would let go. It's fine. Right. And, Right. Everything eventually leaves you, and un un unless you leave it, it leaves you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. That's beautiful. Was there anything else that you think hurts people from the law of attraction and manifesting what they want? We talked about the neediness and coming from a place of lack. Yeah. Um, well, we talked, maybe one yeah. other thing. Um, the uh, Sometimes the whatever people want to manifest comes from an egoic place. The ego wants to, by achieving this or that, the ego wants wants to feel more powerful uh, than before. It wants to have an enhanced sense of identity through it by showing to other people that you have more than others. It wants to show its superiority. 
the ego always looks for superiority and so that that could be uh, uh, you may still you may still get what you want but your your power will be greatly diminished if it's an egoic endeavor but even with an egoic endeavor sometimes even that it can could still work with hard work and determines you might get it but it won't make you happy you when you get it you very quickly you will will feel needy again uh interesting so why the, why is that why do you think why do you and i'm sure you know a lot of very famous rich billionaires and people with lots of money who are still suffering and aren't happy inside once they got the thing they wanted why is it that people suffer and struggle when they have lots of money and have the big homes? Why are this is still not enough? Yes, well, to the ego, it's never enough. To the ego, nothing, because the e ego is a sense of lack, a sense of not good enough, not, 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 not enough yet. So it's never enough for the, for the ego. And if you have everything that the world tell, tells you, you really should be happy now because you've got and I've met people like that. They've got money, huge amounts of money. They've got fame and recognition and the private jet. And they've got, can do, do anything, go anywhere at any moment. And that can be particularly uh, um, bad, uh, counterproductive because you cannot fool yourself, the ego cannot fool itself by saying, when I get this, I'll be happy. Because then you can you can still postpone, the ego can say, once I achieve that, I'll be happy. But the person who already has everything, he or she cannot say that anymore. <laughs> because so you have no way, there, there's no excuse anymore, and because you have everything and you're not happy. So then, and this, this is very often people then start taking drugs or engage in other kinds of seeking sensory satisfaction through substances or going from one relationship into another, having sex or whatever they do because they can buy anything they want and they get pretty more and more unhappy because they do all the ego was there and the e ego will never be satisfied. <laughs> no matter what you achieve, uh, the in the course in miracles it says I don't know if you've been there. It says you will you will always know when the the whether the ego was at work when once you achieved it, it it, it hasn't satisfied you. That was <laughs> right. ego. Uh, yeah. So there's another there's another saying that goes there are two ways of being unhappy. One is not getting what you want, and the other one is getting what you want. <laughs> wow. That refers to the ego. So you, sure. you can, some people are unhappy because they don't get what they want, and the others are unhappy because they get everything they want. <laughs> but it's still ego. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Is, how, do you, how does someone be happy while they're on the path of trying to manifest, you know, more in their life, more a better relationship or better qualities that they have in their current relationship, more career success, money, things like this. How can they be happy no matter what happens? It comes to you or it doesn't? Happiness starts with the alignment with the present moment. It can only arise if you're aligned with the present moment. Uh, I sometimes call that the, the vertical dimension of life, which is now. And then there's a horizontal dimension of life is where it's past and future and you have a goal you're working towards, that's fine. You have the horizontal dimension uh, and the vertical dimension is the present moment. The horizontal dimension is, is the dimension of becoming. You become good at something or you acquire something, you become something. There's an evolutionary process at work and that obviously has its place, it, it's there. Uh, but if you're too, if you're exclusively focused on becoming and achieving, entertaining and acquiring, you're always you're trapped on the horizontal, and you can never really enjoy the present moment, uh, because the present moment is the vertical dimension here now, inseparable from the now. The cross 
the symbol of the cross, one could interpret as, which is an ancient, it even predates Christianity, the symbol of a cross can be interpreted as the inter pointing to the intersection between the horizontal and vertical dimension of life. That is uh, the sort of the importance then is to to d discover the dimension, the vertical dimension, which is the power of the of the now, the present moment, and then the horizontal dimension works actually works better uh, and you're not dependent on it for your ultimate satisfaction you're not dependent on any kind of achievement attainment or whatever it is that from the horizontal dimension for your art it, it, it may give you some kind of satisfaction but, but not the deepest satisfaction the deepest satisfaction is inseparable from going more deeply into the present moment and discover the essence of who or what you are as consciousness itself, presence, here and now. And you, you could, you, 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 in other words, you could say, you sense the beingness of you. You sense that you are. And, and you, there is an enormous power there that has no form. You can't interpret it. It's, 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 a, it's the power of aliveness itself, here and now. It, it goes far beyond who or what you are as a person. The person exists on the horizontal dimension, but there is a deeper dimension to who you are that is only discovered in the vertical dimension. In the vertical dimension, you are already complete. Ah. There is, there's nothing to achieve there. You're, there. you're already full and complete. On that's the so hard for people to. That's so hard for people to comprehend where they don't feel complete. On the horizontal, you're not complete, and you'll never ah. be complete. Gotcha. Okay. Because no matter what you achieve, if you become good at one thing, you lose something together. There's always a world of polarities on the horizontal dimension. Um, that even I find that still the you you achieve you achieve great things. Um, before I used I've been teaching spiritual awakening for many 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 years. Uh, in the past, I had intimate groups of 10, 20 people. Now I, there's hundreds or thousands Arenas. of people often come. Yeah. I don't have the, the close relationship with individuals anymore. It's just can't. I'm reaching many more people, but uh, I've lost this closer connection with the people that I'm teaching. There's always a price to pay. On the other hand, I'm reaching far more people than before. But there's always a price to pay, even privacy. I'm not a great celebrity, but I do. Wherever I go, people say, oh, my God. <laughs> and, so, and the moment it happens, it's wonderful. I love the connection that I feel. But I do lose privacy because sometimes people watch, what's he eating, what's he doing? Why is he drinking coffee? Uh, whatever. <laughs> I thought he was spiritual, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you lose something. The other horizontal, there's like always gain and loss, the world of polarities, and the and the becoming, the becoming dimension. You become uh, again has to, as a positive and a negative side. On the one hand, you can become stronger as you grow up. You become well, you can become more knowledgeable. You become wealthier, but eventually, the becoming becomes. Both negative because then your body becomes weaker because you get old, uh, <laughs> and, and maybe you lose something, and then you become. So the becoming, this the polarities operate on the horizontal dimension, but it has it's without the access to the vertical dimension, nothing can satisfy you truly, purely on the horizontal dimension. So the vertical dimension is the present moment. To, to realize that, that the power of the present moment that is inseparable from who or what you are in your essence, the power of you. And that is that is not an egoic thing because this you far transcends who or what you are as a person. It connects you with the identity of the universe itself. The This is in the, it's the I am without adding anything to it. I am in the Old Testament, uh, prophet asks, meets God and asks, asks God, what is your name? And God says, 
I am the I am. That is a very deep statement. That is the beingness itself. Beingness itself. And you can feel that, you can sense that here and now. When you, for a moment your mind subsides, you're not thinking anymore without making an effort. You're not thinking anymore. And who are you without any thought? You can't explain what it is, but you can sense that there is a light of consciousness. There is a presence. Right. An inherent sense of aliveness. Sometimes people can feel it with their, with their entire body. That the entire body is pervaded by a sense of aliveness. You are. All you, um, that's the ancient Greeks already said, uh, know thyself as the most important thing in life. Know thyself. And that refers to the deepest knowing, knowing yourself as consciousness. And then the person still operates for a while, and it operates actually much better when you're connected to, the, to, the, to that which transcends the person. Right. Where in other, if you want, if you, for those people who are comfortable with theistic language, you could say that is that connects you to God. That is a deeper connection to to the source of all life. You're connected to that. I see the consciousness that is that you share with every human being. Uh, when you look at another human being, you interact with another human being. On the one level, you have the personality horizontal dimension, the conditioning, mental, emotional conditioning, you're interacting with a person, but you're, uh, you're also interacting with consciousness, yes, which is beyond the person. And when you can sense the consciousness that you are is also the consciousness that the other person is, you can sense the oneness of that consciousness. And that sensing of oneness is ultimately what the deeper meaning of love. Right. Love is to recognize the other as ultimately one with who or what you are, one the, the recognition. I uh, uh, I would say love is the recognition of oneness. It's not the egoic love that says, "I need you, don't you dare leave me," because if you do, I'll hate you. <laughs> right. It's not that. That's the egoic so-called love. But the real love is to recognize yourself in the other. But in order to do that, you need to. First, recognize yourself in yourself beyond the person. So, and and that that connects you with other humans in a very different way. This sense of connectedness that you then have. Yes, it's a one. The word for it, what would you this been? There's a a goodwill flows out from you towards others, even others that you might only meet casually for a few seconds. You could you can sense. Yeah, a good an outflow of goodwill and connectedness, and feel so good to recognize there's a there is a human being there. Oh, my interpretation of human being is <laughs> the English language doesn't have a word that uh, refers to both men and women. So you have to say human being. Uh, in German, you have a word Mensch, which could is a human being could be either man or woman. But in English, you have to say human being. And I love that because the human dimension is the person that lives on the horizontal dimension. The being is the essence of who you are. And it's our destiny to recognize our being, which is far beyond the person. And then you become, this is the human, and this is the being. And then you are a true human being when you realize the being of your yourself because then you wow you sense it in others too and then you can love others that's the beauty of it you mentioned love just now i'm curious about you when do you feel the most loved when you're going about your day when do you feel the most loved personally um i don't make differentiate between loving and being loved it's all it's all one so um, I, I feel that the, the connection is there the moment I interact with somebody. There is that connectedness. And sometimes people respond, something within them responds back, and then you get the same energy back. They may not know why, 
uh, for let's say you let's say you're in a restaurant and you I'm in the restaurant and I'm ordering the, the waiter waitress comes and so you have on the one hand on the human level you are the the guest or the client the, in the restaurant and this person is the server that's on the human level you have your identity uh, but is that all there is no there is the server is for this is only a temporary function that's not the real identity of of this human being and i'm not well, my identity is not to be a client or guest of this restaurant right. it's a temporary thing so am i able to recognize the being in this human the human is the server but behind that there's a being and when i look at this person and i'm there's a really let's see if i can describe it how i experience it there's a while i the person talks to me there's there's a still presence it's a, i listen through this the still the still presence in the in that still presence i can sense beyond the human the beingness of the other also i can sense their beingness and that is the connection and then it sometimes happens that they can feel something that they feel acknowledged in their beingness they, they may not be able to interpret that in or they may miss without you saying that. anything without you saying anything yeah. nothing to say uh, um, and so or usually it means that they often it means that they they like you as they they feel uh, attracted to you they love you as a person in their bit uh, they like to be in your presence they there's a re positive response and that is one could say that is love coming back at you so it uh, you send it out and you don't always get it back sometimes the person may be so deeply trapped in their ego that they, that nothing much gets through and that's and that's fine that's where they're at at the moment but it still feels good to to feel this emanation but very often when the emanation is reflected and then comes back and then you feel loved too the of course usually the other person doesn't understand it at deeper level doesn't understand that what they love in you is not the person it's something right. deeper and that connects both of you um, so i i feel it's always an uh the process is, mu is always mutual i feel even when you, when you love a flower uh, even the flower there's a certain this might sound a little mystical but uh, there's a there's a certain response that you get of, of the way I should put it. Sometimes, when I recognize and appreciate the beauty of a tree or a flower, uh, I, this is similar because even the tr the flower of the tree is a manifestation of consciousness at a different vibrational frequency from a human. So, everything is a vibration of consciousness that is taken temporary form. So the the flower, the tree are also a manifestation of consciousness. And when I recognize and appreciate that the beauty of the flower or the tree, uh, we there there is a sense of oneness, and and at that moment the tree can sense that it is being recognized and it becomes aware of its own beauty through you. So you redeem nature. You give. You add something to nature by recognizing the sacredness and beauty of nature. You add something to nature. Wow. And then we can say nature loves you back too. You can sense wow, that's that. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah. So I sometimes recommend people should go go to a tree and, and allow the tree to teach you stillness because the tree is there. It's deeply rooted in the earth and there its branches and it's very still. It might have been there for 100 years, 200 years. It's very, it's still, you approach it. And nature can teach you, anything in nature can teach you that the stillness connect you with the dimension that's beyond egoic consciousness. Wow. This is beautiful, Eckhart. Is, is there anything that you struggle with these days personally? Is there... You know, you've done this work and practiced it and taught it for so long. Is there anything you s struggle or suffer with 
in your own life that is still a challenge? Oh, there's, yeah, there are challenges. Um, I'm not good at dealing with the practical things so much anymore of life, uh, um, financial things and so on can feel as a bit of a burden sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but the, the humans are, but otherwise there's no suffering. I don't, I don't have periods of, of suffering at all that's gone. Uh, the humans have, um, uh, and just being and doing is another way of putting it. Uh, the being dimension is the vertical, the doing dimension is the horizontal. Uh, the two are important. Some humans are more drawn towards doing, creating, manifesting. Doing. Yes. Others are more drawn towards being, appreciating what it is and may, mm -hmm. not, have man, may not have many of uh, um, goals to achieve they have, might be happy doing their gardening or whatever they feel they want and it's, yeah, every human has to find a kind of balance between being and doing nobody probably is completely in the middle or it's very hard to be completely in the middle you're totally balanced between being and doing um i'm more always more inclined to i'm in the being dimension and for a few years when i was younger i experienced a kind of awakening uh, i was kind of so much in the being dimension that i lost interest in any kind of doing for a few years really <laughs> it was so wow. the present moment was so joyful and beautiful and i had no money nothing for a while i had no home but it was lovely big sitting on park benches present moment was so fulfilling <laughs> and then gradually i was able to start doing again and now i am still I love just be, just to be, to contemplate nature, or ju even to, just to sit in a room and just be. Uh, but, all, but I, I'm able to do because I, well, I wrote the books. I do teachings. I travel, so I give talks and retreats. So I'm, I am doing. I, I'm, I, able to function on that level. But the irony is. That all the all my doing is in the service of teaching being. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So you'll do for a week, and then you're like, "I'm going to go be for a month." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, Eckhart. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I have two final questions, uh, kind of quicker questions for you. But before uh, I ask those, I want people to get your books. Again, the Power of Now is one that I read many years ago that I highly recommend. Uh, to everyone, and also uh, this book as well, which is it's become you know more popular in the last few years. I feel like it's got this resurgence, even though I think it's fifteen years, fifteen yeah. years ago you wrote uh, it. I in think. In fact, uh, Oprah uh, said, Oprah said, uh, if you only read one book in your life, read read a new earth, <laughs> a new earth, awakening to your life's purpose. So make sure you guys get both copies, start in whichever one you want, uh, but both of them are amazing. Also, if people want to connect with you, they can go to your website. Uh, we'll have everything linked up as well in here. And you're starting to get more content on social media. So make sure to follow uh, Eckhart over on YouTube and all the different platforms that you're on. And I really want to acknowledge you before I ask these final two questions, Eckhart, for your level of service. Again, you could be 24-7 and sit in the woods and in the room and, and, and be a happy human being, just being. You've already done so much for humanity with your work, your message, workshops, and everything you've done. Uh, so I acknowledge you for continuing to be of service, continuing to serve when you choose to, when you show up, when you deliver, when you're coming on here and doing this. I know this is going to reach millions of people over time and impact them profoundly. So I'm very appreciative and grateful to you for being a messenger of love, of generosity, of kindness, and teaching those who are struggling and suffering how to get back into alignment of who they truly are so they can be peaceful and in harmony in the now. So I really wanted to acknowledge you and appreciate you for taking the time. Uh, these two final questions. First one is, is a hypothetical scenario a question? I call this the three truths. 
So I'd like for you to imagine, even though you never imagine the future that much because you're always in the now, but I'd like for you to go there for a moment and imagine you get to live as long as you want to in this realm. But for whatever reason, it's the last day. And for whatever reason, in this hypothetical question, all your message is gone. It's got to go with you to the next place or it's just not in this world anymore. So your books, this interview, any workshop you've done online, it's we don't have access to it. But you get to leave behind three lessons to the world, three truths that you know are true for you. And this is all we would have to be reminded of your messages. What would be those three truths for you? Well, um, ultimately, the the truth, uh, uh, the ultimate truth is is one, I, and so you can let out of the one, so you can extrapolate and several other truths may arise out of one. The ultimate truth is uh, realize who or what you are, realize that you are in essence not a person, you are consciousness, you are a manifestation of universal consciousness. You are the universe experiencing itself as a human. You are the consciousness of the universe experiencing itself briefly, but you are far beyond to realize who or what you are beyond the person. So that's the ultimate truth. Then realize that you, you are not the ego that is uh, discovering who or what you are not. And uh, realize the possibility of living without... Uh, Suffering, the suffering that's created by the human mind, the uh, the possibility of, of being free of suffering, free of unhappiness, and uh, the way towards that is radical acceptance of the isness of the present moment, the un radical acceptance of the isness of now, that will take you to, to a deep place of realization of who or what you are, and you're not the ego. The, realizing who you're not, not is important part, part of the it's a kind of negative realization, who you are not. Once you realize who or what you are ultimately not, then who or what you are emerges naturally. That's beautiful. Uh, final question for you, Eckhart. What is your definition of greatness? Well, um, of course, as you know, one can give many, many definitions according to one's level of consciousness, but at the deepest level, greatness is, again, when you go to the deepest level, the answer is always the same, by the way. <laughs> uh, greatness is to, uh, to live consciously, to embody consciousness in th this lifetime, to embody the unconditioned consciousness in this lifetime. That is greatness. And then other things arise out of that. You affect the world in many different ways by living as consciousness and consciously rather than as an egoic entity. Uh, so then you you begin to change the world even if you don't say, oh, I am going to change the world. It happens organically and naturally. So the, And the way in which you experience the world is always a reflection of your state of consciousness. So you begin to experience a different world when you are aligned with the, like what I call the unconditioned consciousness, that is who or what you are in your essence. That is the uh, greatness is uh, to have fulfilled your purpose in this incarnation on this earth and that is to be part of the evolving consciousness of the universe. That is greatness, to have fulfilled your purpose. And the, all the outer conditions are secondary. And you could, theoretically, you could have fulfilled your purpose even in the prison cell when you come to this realization. Four things you want to change, how you act. How do, you, how do you act? You complain, you blame, you make excuses, you feel sorry for yourself. That's a victim consciousness.
What emotions do you live by? Is it possible that you're so used to living by guilt, mm. you don't even know it's guilt, it just feels like you? Do you, you allow your energy to drop? Become conscious of those states of mind.